Well, good morning, East at home. Uh, great to be speaking to you this morning, and I thought I'd come to a different space. I actually found a quiet little room at Hartnier Street because I thought if I filmed this sitting on my own couch at home and you are now sitting on my couch in my living room watching this, that would feel a little bit weird. We're in the middle of our Uncommon series and in the middle of a mini-series in the middle of that called sort of Uncommon Relationship. And uh, we're talking about vines and branches and we're in this picture that Jesus is sharing in John 15. And we're going to share the uh, next four verses of that right now. If you've got a Bible, uh, turn with me. We're in John 15 verses 5 to 8. I'm going to read them, I'm going to pray, I'm going to share out of that passage. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves, showing yourselves to me, my disciples. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this moment. I want to thank you for this time as we get to gather together. Right now, we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would illuminate, that you'd bring clarity uh, to your word as we open it together. And out of this, you would bring about incredible conversation and challenge and encouragement, Lord, that would bring change. Lord God, we want Monday to be different because of today. And so, Lord God, we pray, we invite you into these moments. Be with us, lead us, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to assume you in all the living rooms across the eastern suburbs are saying amen right now. This morning, within this context of sort of uncommon relationship, I want to look at a sub-uncommon, and it's this idea of uncommon purpose. You know, I want to think about this. What is your purpose? I wonder how you would answer that question. I think many people in our world are asking that question. Why am I here? You know, what's the importance? What's the purpose of life? How do I ensure that my life counts? For many organisations, when they come across this sort of question, they have a mission statement, a, a purpose statement, something short and catchy that says, for, for all of time, this is what we want our business to be about. This is what we're trying to achieve. I remember being in economics class at school and learning about this. And I remember the teacher talking about Fujifilm and their mission statement. And it was simply this, kill Kodak, <laughs> kill Kodak. And, and I have never forgotten that moment, never forgotten that purpose for them. Here's my prayer for us this morning, that we would have one of those never forget moments. We'd have one of those moments where, that forever clarifies from this moment on what we are about. That this be, would be like a guiding principle for us. That it would clarify what we're going to pursue. That it would clarify what we're going to avoid. That this morning what we're looking at would be like this lens through which we see all of life. You see, I think John 15 is this clarifying purpose moment here's what jesus says verse 8 this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples here's the purpose i think jesus has for our lives to glorify god that's it to glorify god you know, glory was such an important concept in John's gospel. When Jesus turns water into wine, John, John writes, this is the first moment we got to see his glory. When, when Jesus stands outside Lazarus's tomb, a friend of his that had been dead for three days, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says, this was so that you'd see glory. 
glory then in part is when we get to see what God does. It's this glimpse of glory. You know, but again and again, in John's gospel, glory points to the cross. You know, this moment when the, God's one and only son came and hung brutally on a cross to pay the price for the sin of humanity, only then to give the gift of eternal life to humanity for free, though it costs God everything. The cross is the greatest expression of the magnificence and the wonder of the character of God. And so glory isn't just seeing what God does, it is also seeing what God is like. And Jesus is saying, just as that was his purpose, to show what God does and to show what God is like, so his purpose for our lives is to show what God does and show what God is like to bring God glory. You know, this is way more than the meeting that we have made church, the time and the place. This is asking, you know, this is the lens through which I'm going to see all of life. This is not about rules. This is not about saying how much is enough for me to do. Suddenly when my purpose is the glory of God, the sky is the limit. This is not limited by your ability. This is not limited by your time availability. This is not limited by wealth. It's not limited by stage or age or disability or wealth. None of those things limit you when you make this the purpose of your life. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, no matter what is going on for you to say, my purpose in this moment is to bring glory to the Father, to show what God does and to show what God is like. The inevitable, you know, have you ever wondered what it would be like if Jesus was in the room right now? Ever wondered what it would be like if Jesus was at school pickup? If Jesus was in the supermarket? If Jesus was in your workplace? I wonder what he would be doing. I wonder what he he would be noticing, or you would be noticing about him. Can we take that wondering a step further and say maybe those are the things that he is wanting to do in your life? Amazing. But let's take that a step further. You see, the, the inevitable question then is how? You know, our natural inclination is let's draw up a list. You know, how do we achieve that? And we're in the middle of this picture of the vine and the branches. You know, but you never see a vine straining to produce grapes. Like Martinborough would be a really noisy place to go if all you could hear was the sound of vines going, <clears throat> trying to produce fruit. No, grapes are the inevitable consequence of healthy vines. I think part of the reason Jesus is giving us this picture of the vine and the branches is because he said your natural inclination, if you want this to be the purpose of your life, is to focus on how do I go about producing that sort of fruit. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't look out. I want you initially to look in. Don't wonder how am I going to produce this fruit. Look at the one who actually wants to produce that fruit through you. And the answer then is remain in me as I remain in you. That is the focus of this passage, the word that comes again and again and again. If you desire this to be your purpose, if you desire that, that your life will bring God, God glory by showing what he does and showing what he is like, the secret is not out but in. It is remaining. I think there are three things in this passage that I want us to talk about. That, uh, that, 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 that show us what remaining is about. Here's the first one. Remaining is telling myself what Jesus has done. Remaining is telling myself what Jesus has done. We began last week by saying that remaining begins with believing. John 6, 56 says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, sounds a bit weird, <laughs> remains in me and I in him. Jesus is saying the way you begin 
to remain is by believing that the death of Jesus Christ was to forgive your sin, was on your behalf. And as you believe that and as you receive that, it's like you arrive, you, you, be, you begin to remain in him. But then, you know, we go just a verse onwards and Jesus says, verse six, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. We're like, whoa, where did that come from? But let's think context for a moment, right? These 11 guys that Jesus is speaking to at this moment, Jesus knows full well that the early the church is going to be born through them. That they're going to be people who actually bear much fruit. These are going to be genuine disciples. These are going to bear much fruit. So he's not saying this to scare them. That's not the purpose of this. So we're not to take it in that way. And in fact, for John, um, for John, the security of salvation was huge for him. But just as remaining begins with believing, how do you know you're still remaining? Surely it's that we're persevering in believing, that we're not talking about, oh, I had an experience one year ago. Oh, I prayed a prayer 10 years ago. Oh, I believed at some point in the past. It's that right here, right now, we are continuing to believe in Jesus. And I think this is why remaining has to involve reminding ourselves, telling ourselves what Jesus has done. Because we live in a culture that is increasingly antagonistic to the message of Jesus. There is precious little in our culture that is going to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus, encourage you in and, and, and raise up your love for Jesus. This is why I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, what are we doing to grow our love for Jesus? You know, if you're anything like me, there are moments like uh, I've been known to have moments in the middle of the night where I wake up and I'm like, is this actually all true? Like, is, is, is Jesus real? I, can I be honest with you and say, I have had moments like that. And in that place, I'm not thinking, did I have something in the past? I'm not thinking, how do I feel? I begin to think through, Simon, what do you know to be true? And I begin to tell myself the message of Jesus again. That's why I'm so grateful for people like Mike Morrison, who has his group once a month on Reasoned Faith Wellington, where people are looking at apologetics. They're thinking through the reasons for the hope that they have. And that's super useful if you're, if you're talking about spiritual things with colleagues, you're talking about spiritual things with neighbours or, or people in your own family. But another reason I find that sort of group so helpful is because sometimes the person I find who needs to hear the gospel the most is me. And so remaining, I think, has to do with reminding myself, telling myself what Jesus has done. Verse 7 gives us the second thing about remaining. Jesus, he's talked about, hey, if you remain in me and I in you. But verse 7, he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Notice the difference there. Remaining, remaining is literally like staying at somebody's house. You remained overnight and then you stayed overnight in somebody's house. But there's a difference between being a guest and being a permanent resident. Like if you're going to come and stay at our house, we don't have any spare beds for you. So you're going to have to sleep on the couch and uh, you're going to have to live out of a suitcase because we don't have a spare wardrobe and we may not have enough seats around the table for you. So we'll might pull out the emergency chairs and squash up and make sure there's a space for you at the table. You know, you're getting the distinct impression you can stay for a bit. But there'll be a time when it becomes a bit inconvenient <laughs> and actually you're going to have to sort of pack up that suitcase and move on. But if you're going to stay permanently, I'm going to find a room. You're going to have a proper bed. We're going to make sure you've got a wardrobe for you to hang your clothes up in. You know, we'll make sure there's a big enough table and, and, and there's a chair for you. We're going to make sure there's enough food for you. You know, we're giving you the distinct impression here. You belong. You can remain. And it leaves me with the question. Is Jesus's word just on a pull up 
on, on a pull-out bed, on a, on a blow-up mattress in the living room? Is, is Jesus' word a couch surfer in my life? Or am I letting Jesus know your word can remain? Even when it's inconvenient, I want your word to be a permanent resident in my life. Here's the thing, though. If, <laughs> you might just have allowed Jesus in as a couch surfer in your life, but here's my experience. Once you let him in, he doesn't sit still for long. He'll be sweeping and mopping and cleaning up. He'll start clearing out the junk. He'll start rearranging furniture. He will start a renovation in your life. Here's how it happens. Notice verse 2. We looked at it, well, we sort of looked at it last uh, week. It's talking about the father and the, and, and the branches. It says he, he um, I've got to find it now. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch in me that does bear fruit, that is already bearing fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This phrase, you know, every branch of me that does bear fruit, he prunes and then you are already clean can seem like really, really confusing until you realize that in the Greek, the word for prunes and the word for cleans are really, really similar. So they're sort of synonymous. You could easily translate prunes as cleans. And, and so for them, like the words were really, really similar in the way they sounded and, and they mean really, really similar things. So here's what I think Jesus is saying is, it's through my word that I began to clean up your life. The message of the gospel, I cleaned you up. But I want to continue to clean you. I want to continue to prune you. And it's through my word that I'm going to do that too. The thing is, pruning isn't pleasant, right? In fact, if you've ever seen a bush being pruned, a, 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 a tree being pruned, it seems counterintuitive. Why would you cut something so that it becomes even more fruitful? I bet the plant in that moment is like, oh, actually, that's uncomfortable. Actually, that hurts. But the purpose of that pruning is so that it will be even more fruitful. I was thinking about a proverb this week it, who keeps... His word, he keeps his promises even when it hurts. And it was like, oh, it was a pruning moment for me. It was a, oh, a difficult moment. I winced. You know, I, I, I like to think of myself as, as somebody who keeps his promises, whose who's yes means yes. And then I read it says, you know, who keeps his promises even when it hurts. And I'm like, oh, do I keep my promises when it's inconvenient? Do I keep my promises? Do I, does my yes mean yes, even when I suddenly realize maybe I've overpromised? Do I need to learn to be to be? Um, do I need to learn about the promises I make? Do I keep them even when it's inconvenient? It was a pruning moment. It was a pruning moment. You know, it makes me just think about the way we treat Jesus's word, the way we treat Scripture. Has it made you wince recently? Has it challenged us recently? Here's the thing. Because if, if we never wince, if we're never made uncomfortable by the words of Jesus, it makes me wonder whether we're listening to Jesus at all. His word is a pruning word so that we might be even more fruitful. And you know what? It prepares us for what is to come. The third thing about remaining is it's not just reminding myself of what Jesus, of the message of Jesus. It's not just making room for what he has said. Remaining is also asking him to do what he has promised. Remaining is asking him to do what we, he has promised. Notice verse uh, seven says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I don't know about you, but I read that and that word wish just sort of leaps off the page. Like that seems such an unbiblical word. I don't really know. Uh, it makes Jesus sound a bit like a genie. You know, ask whatever you wish. I'll give you three wishes and I will do whatever you ask. It just seems a little bit weird. And I just want to dig into that a little bit. This, this verse on prayer, basically, comes hot on the heels of, of another verse Jesus 
spoke on prayer in the chapter 14 that we looked at a few weeks ago. And they're really, really similar. Uh, verse 13 of chapter 14 says this, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And so I notice some similarities. We're allowed to ask for whatever we want. In both situations, there is this assurance that Jesus is going to say yes. But there are more similarities than that. Both verses refer to the glory of the Father, right? The things that bring the Father glory. And in the first one, what um, Jesus was talking about there is, I do the works of the Father, and now you are going to do the works of the Father. In fact, you're going to do even greater things than I've been doing. And here Jesus is talking about, there, there is fruit that is coming from me, and I desire that for that to be produced through your life works and fruit and, and both of those bringing the Father glory. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. The greatest purpose of which you are capable is bringing the Father glory. And, and as you're reminding yourself of what I've done for you, and as you're making room for the renovating word of God in your life, you're beginning to see things like I'm seeing. Your desires are being cleaned up. Your ambitions are being purified. The desires of your heart are being released to want what I want, to desire what I desire. And so as you're being refined and pruned in that way, suddenly what are you going to be asking? You're not going to be asking about, can the Canes win Super Rugby every year? Though I continue to pray there, <laughs> what you're beginning to pray is, Lord, I want my life to matter. <laughs> I want to live out the greatest purpose of which I am capable. I want to bring God glory. And so, Lord, I'm asking you, let my life show the things you do. Let my life show the word, that, that, that show the world what you are like. And Lord, I don't want to to start with me. I want it to be in my children. I want it for my neighbours. I want it for my colleagues. I want this city to see what you're like. And I want this city to see what you do. And I realise you want to use me for that purpose. And so God, I don't care about these other things. They seem quite trivial. The greatest thing I want to ask you about is that my life would matter. That I would live out this purpose to bring God glory. Can I say those are the prayers Jesus answers. Those are the things that Jesus wants to do every single time. See, suddenly it makes sense in Luke where the disciples say, Jesus teaches to pray. Here's what, they, here's what Jesus says. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Set apart, holy, revered be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says the same thing. Father, would you be glorified? Would you be glorified in my life? You know, this world is a crazy, crazy place. 2020, man. Can you believe it? Global pandemics, wildfires, recessions, job losses. We've got an election coming up. It's been a crazy, crazy year. And on top of all that, can I say it's been a deep year for us as a church. Not only with what's going on, but you know, we're grieving miscarriages. And we're grieving lost parents. And we're caring for sick kids. And we're caring for... for for sick parents, and some of us are concerned about our businesses, some of us are concerned about the economy, some of us are concerned about our pensions, some of us are concerned about our jobs, some of us are concerned about singleness, some of us are concerned about our marriages. Like this has been a big, big year for a small church we are experiencing a lot. And can I just say, first and foremost, thank you. You know, Jimmy and I are continually blown away by the way you care for one another, the way you love for one another, the way you are going above and beyond. Let's keep doing that. But I think a great, the greatest risk for us is that in that challenge, we begin to turn in. And we begin to hunker down and we just begin to say it is too tough for us to think beyond us and beyond the here and now. We are going to turn in and we're going to focus in. 
But I believe if we did that, we would miss something. Because no matter how tough it is for us, imagine grappling with what you are grappling with, with no concept of Jesus. You know, because the world outside of Jesus has no basis for believing that tomorrow will be any better than today. Think about it for a moment. The world outside of Jesus has no basis, no assurance for believing that human history will end well. It has no basis for peace beyond what we can control and turn out for our own purposes. But it's into that world that God sent his one and only son. And when people heard him speak, they're like, wow, you have the words of eternal life. And when people saw what he was like, and when people saw how people tr he treated others, and, and when people saw the, the incredible things he did, they said, wow, we're seeing what God does. We're seeing what God is like. And they gave glory to the Father. And it led him to a life where he died on the cross to pay the price for sinful humanity so that you and I could come into an everlasting relationship with the Father. And when he rose again, people got to see a glimpse of the greatest glimpse ever of the glory of God. And it is he, the risen Jesus, who says to you, just as I have been showing what God is like and just as I have been showing what God has done, has done it does so my greatest purpose for your life is that you would do the same that you bring glory to the father by doing what god does and showing what god is like and so that the message of jesus might bring hope and peace and joy and life and hope and a future to the world around you that in and of itself has none no basis for those things can I invite you today to have one of those never forget kill Kodak moments to say my life from this moment on will be about the glory of God. And so I need to not look out initially, but look in and say, I want to remain. <laughs> Jesus, I want a deeper richer, more profound relationship with you. And I think three beginning keys for that. We're going to start by reminding ourselves what Jesus has done for us. We're going to, we're going to remain by making sure there is room for his word in our life to, to begin and continue a renovation. And, and in that renovating place, we're going to be asking, oh, Jesus, let my life matter. Let my life count. There are many things I want you to do in my life, but, but let the greatest thing that you do, if nothing else, do this. Let my life bring the Father glory. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this is our desire to bring you glory. And in the conversations that are going to go on now and the questions that are going to be asked, Lord God, let our lives matter. Let us be a church that brings you glory by doing what you've been doing and showing more people what you're like. Lord, let our lives matter. Let us live out this purpose. Go to work right now by your spirit. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.